my pictures were always my mom and I in a chair crying and my dad standing up over us yelling with big angry teeth and like beer and my mom and I like very small little in this chair crying so again you know be gentle <laughs> So I know over the years, bits of my story have come out. And uh, in 2018, I did a Assumptions About Me video, and I shared the story in there about uh, my father's alcoholism and suicide. And I um, also, in a video a couple years ago, when I was doing my makeup, I shared a story about when I got beaten up at a bowling alley by my friend's mom. And that's why I have, I call it a crack in my lip. Some folks have asked if, you know, if I was born with a cleft palate or um, if I've had lip injections gone wrong or whatever, but it's a scar. And I didn't even know that I, um, I didn't realize that I had it. Like I didn't realize, I wasn't self-aware with how I looked with the scar on my lip until I started doing these YouTube videos seven or we'll just jump up to eight years ago now, right? So those are two big stories. So there's more, there's more stories. I would like to try to tell you <laughs> the story the best that I can. There's probably some parts that I'm going to leave out to protect other people that I love. This is not a, a sad and depressing video. Um, I really feel like I'm an overcomer and uh, you know the, oops, I just totally moved uh, this spice rack that my camera is sending on. Sorry, it's on a swivel. That Mandisa song, Overcomer, I feel like, you know, like that's my song. I, I do feel like I'm an overcomer. I feel like I'm an overcomer with Jesus by my side and Jesus is the thing I have going for me. Through all of this, developing a personal relationship with Jesus at a very, very young age has helped me with all this mess I've been through. And of course, I'm not saying that what I have been through is the ultimate amount that a person can go through. It's just my story. And so I feel like stories are so important and stories need to be shared. And when I grow up, <laughs> I would like to write uh, some books about some of my stories. And one of the things I always do is I look for, well, what do I have in front of me right now? and I make these videos. And I feel like if I share my story the best that I can, it very well can help you and help other people and help us all be overcomers. <laughs> I mean, you know, just help us all uh, with the hard things that we're dealing with, work to overcome those situations. I'm 43 now, yay! I, I just had my 43rd birthday and I am still deeply tangled up in my childhood story. I think I've had a lot of healing. I don't think I'm as tangled and confused as I was as a young adult coming out of it, kind of like, I don't know what just happened, but I think I have to, I didn't know these terms at the time, but you know, I think I have to renew my mind and uh, get some things straight because wow, that, that was a lot. And I would like to, if I could jump in here and get started, right? But you know me, a whole lot of words, if I'm able to, and I'm sorry, I keep looking down folding this napkin because I guess it's comforting for me while I'm talking, but it may end up being in another video, but I would definitely like to share with you things I have done to help myself. Anyway, back at the beginning. So my parents were married for about uh, 10 years before they had me, and that wasn't necessarily because they wanted to wait 10 years before they had a child. My mom and my dad loved each other very much and they were married July 4th, 1969. I believe it was 69 or 68, 69, pretty sure. They had a lovely wedding and they had, I'll just say, a lovely first several years of their marriage. My dad drank. He drank from a very young age and my mom, as a young bride and having not been around an alcoholic or anything like that growing up, she hadn't seen those kind of things. She just thought 
he was funny when he drank and I think you know sometimes he would fall asleep and at some point he did become very sick no one knew why he was very sick we're in the early 70s now he was an auto mechanic and a what they call a body man by trade he was an artist with cars and he could take a car that was totaled and you know we used to explain it like a car that looked like spaghetti and make it brand new and that's what he loved to do and somewhere within there i believe he had his own garage at one point i think he had a gas station excuse me while i scratch my neck they were doing well as a young couple they bought their first home as my mom explained it uh you know they had drawers full of money and they didn't know what to do with it so my dad built a garage at their first house and again and i wasn't born during this time he just he just got very sick so very sick and my mom thought he might die i mean just he was ill he was also drinking a lot he was probably doing a lot of drugs he would go out in the garage and think the devil was talking to him i mean he he was just uh having a hard time they didn't have kids yet and my mom had a great job and again they they were doing well as a young couple that's their story but that's a little bit of the history passed down to me he had a lot of friends and family and people in his life that he would drink with and he was losing a lot of weight just overall the man wasn't doing well so my mom got an idea to get him and them out of the area that they were living in uh, to take him somewhere where um, like he could be out of the city there wasn't a bar on every corner I mean you know maybe that would fix it I mean it's worth a shot right maybe some of the influences that were heavy would be gone and they bought a big track of land in the country and they moved for about a year my dad healed to a point he was not running to the bars or necessarily drinking heavily as he had been. As his healing during that year, you know, my mom, I have shared before, my mom is a horsewoman. She's a professional horsewoman. Even now in her nearly mid 70s, you know, she rides professionally with the American Side Saddle Association and uh, still wins trophies and ribbons and all kinds of fun things. So in her 20s, you know, she was all about her love of horses. And so during that first year that they were on that country property, my dad built my mom this big, huge dream barn. They didn't build a house first, they built a barn first. And they got a trailer, like a, a, I guess a nice trailer for the time. And we did have a family member that lived in it later, so I do have some memories of it. Like, you, of course, I wanna tell you about the house design, right? You like, you come in, there's a living room and a kitchen, you go down a hallway, there's a bathroom and a couple bedrooms, so anyway. Um, so they lived in the trailer. My dad built my mom this dream barn and uh, they had money from selling that first house and such. And I don't think either of them were like working for anyone else during that year. And then when the barn was built and I, I'm sure I am leaving out gaps and, and details again, I, I was not here yet. I, I remember a lot of what I was here for, but this is the prelude to Jay Morrell. Um, and this also explains why they weren't having children earlier on in their marriage. My dad was really sick and my mom didn't know what was gonna happen with him. And her moving them out of the city into the country was a, a beautiful idea. Um, and he did have a level of healing during that time. And I have pictures of uh, my mom and dad riding horses in the mornings um, from that time period. And uh, you know, they were just a beautiful 70s couple. And my mom made all their clothes and she would make like her matching dress and my dad would have a matching like plaid or whatever the, whatever the patterns were, uh, very 70s. But he'd have matching vest or matching like bell bottom type pants. Um, very fashion very very fashion <laughs> and uh 
Anyway, a little bit after that, my mom was like, oh, we should have a house. <laughs> they had a house built because I believe they owned the land and they owned the barn. It wasn't that difficult for them to have. I think Jim Walters was the name of the builder at the time. We used to have that building company all over Virginia. I don't know if Jim Walters is a thing anymore, but building company, you could like pick out your house plans and they would come out and yada, 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 build a house. Um, so they built a lovely house again, so awesome 1970s, like the metallic wallpaper, big orange flowers, shag carpet, like ultra. And it was one of those, um, like a house on stilts, I guess, like a house that you would build near the water. My mom had the foresight to have the bottom enclosed so it would be two stories. And that was the house that they brought me home in. So uh, when my mom got pregnant with me, she didn't know if there would be something wrong with me because there was something wrong with my dad and uh, she wasn't sure if she was gonna keep me. She didn't think too deeply about that. That's just part of the story. She was able to get one of the first ultrasounds available. I mean, I was born in 1979, so this was like cutting edge, high tech, and I believe it was through UVA, but she was able to see me and I had arms and feet and legs and was moving around and I must have done a good job <laughs> of showing her. So anyway, they had me and I think, you know, like the night that my mom had me, my dad was drunk and she didn't see him for a day or two. That's kind of like where my story began. Some of my very first memories are, of course, of my mom. And I also have what I would say are some sweet memories of my dad early on, like, you know, him holding me up on one hand and, you know, just, I had to have been very little, but I do have little snapshots of this. But then what I really remember, and this is a, a tissue moment, um, yeah, I just remember waking up all the time as a small, small child with you know, my dad hadn't been home in several days. We hadn't seen him. And so if it was just my mom and I, everything, you know, we were having happy days. We were going to the barn and holding kitties and brushing the pony. And um, we would walk down to the stump and, you know, play restaurant with the little acorn things. And, you know, very, I had very, very good nurturing from my mom very early on. Um, and I think that that has, you know, helped me greatly. From very early on, I remember waking up and I would know my dad was home because it was just like insane screaming rages. And it would sound like furniture was flying all over the house and chairs were splitting and mirrors were breaking and my mom was crying, begging for him to stop. And part of this also is my mom is multi-talented. So we got the horses, we have fashion design. She was, uh, had, fashion shows at the Kennedy Center and um, she studied pattern design and traveled around with that. Decorating, decorating is another one of her gifts. So anywhere my mom is, is always and always has been decorated absolutely beautiful. So for him to be coming home and tearing up the house was just another like insult to injury, right? Because those were my mom's pretty things. So that is how life was. If he was home, he was drinking and smoking. I don't remember like financial problems when I was, we'll say one, two, three, four. I remember um, at some point within that, you know, my parents, they didn't have any debt until they built their house. But again, other things were paid for. But at some point my dad came home with a brand new car with a real big car payment. And, um, at that point, my mom was staying home with me. So that was a financial burden. And then somewhere within there, I remember my dad was, he was sick again and he was in the hospital again. And I know now he was in the, the mental ward, I guess you can say, the mental facility. Psychiatric, there you go. I, I, I have been a psychiatric nurse. I do know that, know that term. So. He was a psychiatric patient um, and uh, there's pictures of me at the hospital with flowers standing there and I think I was like four, maybe. Um, 
So I just knew from a very young age something wasn't right with my dad. And, uh, and those are just my words, friend, when I say something wasn't right with him. I mean, you know, he, again, he was sick. We didn't know exactly why. So my mom, being a good, industrious, <laughs> creative woman as she is, was trying to figure out, you know, how to live how to support us. She had been home for a couple of years and I wasn't quite school age yet or I was getting to school age here within a year or so. But my dad was in and out of the hospital when he, went, when he wasn't, he was home and drinking or he was gone and drinking. In trying to figure things out, she sold that property with a big chunk of land. I mean, I think it was 20 to 30 acres. It might've even been 40. It, it was a lot of land. But, so she sold the land with the barn and the house. And she had found another little farmhouse, a little yellow farmhouse, yay. And it was on about two perfect acres. And so her plan was to sell the bigger property and to buy something um, that would be, if not paid for, you know, almost paid for, just very low overhead so that while my dad was doing whatever he was doing, uh, we had a place for the horses and we had a home and we had a place to live and those important things. Um, so she sold that and we moved into this house. We called the property Sweet Spirit Farm. I say that, that was, it was my, my mom's creative name. And you know, she painted everything fresh yellow. She got these iron gates that she painted yellow. Also what my mom had been doing at the bigger property is breeding Arabians. She had an Arabian stallion and even back then, you know, 70s and early 80s, one baby horse she could get $10,000 for. So that's it. That's a good stay-at-home mom business, right ladies? But it was very hard to juggle that and my father's illnesses and a little toddler, you know. Um, and, and I remember us having at the first house, um, I re and that farm was called Atomic Acres. And so, uh, but we called it Deep Dark Woods because the house was in the woods and it was just a long wooded driveway. And as a little kid at some point, I called it Deep Dark Woods. So anyway, at Deep Dark Woods, I remember we would have people's mares that would come. I mean, it was set up like a breeding farm with separate paddocks and such. And I remember, um, you know, my mom and I being there waiting up all night for um, the mare to have the baby and uh, a lot of good in the barn, you know, it, a lot of good in the barn memories. Um, so anyway, this next smaller property was not set up to be like a professional breeding farm. Again, two acres and she still had her one dream horse that my dad had got for her many years before. His name was High Voltage. And if you're into horses, if you're, this is a deep one, if you're into Arabian bloodlines, he was a Wittaz II baby. So some people out there that might mean something, but he was just, he was a high quality horse. Um, so high voltage came with us everywhere for a really, really long time. He was at the new property and my pony Sasa was at the property and we had an Arabian mare named Royal. I think we had another baby there. So I mean, you know, we only took, we'll say four or five horses to this property. And my dad, I, I don't remember, you know, drunken stupor or not. I just know he built these like run in barns and shelters and little tack room and we got the horses set up fairly quickly. And so in my mind, because by that point I was five, in my mind we lived at Sweet Spirit Farm for a while. But I think, you know, now looking back, I, I think we were there barely two years. But I have a lot of memories from there. So we'll say the night terrors continued, you know, my dad being drunk at night and breaking up furniture and my mom crying and um, all of that continued. Um, I did start kindergarten there and that was quite stressful because it seemed like all the kids knew how to read <laughs> already at five and I did not. So I was immediately put in the slow reader program 
and I mean I know that's not the worst thing in life to overcome but just saying like it was a shock it was a shock to me to be thrown into school and at an early age like I just remember like trying to survive school and going back there were a few times when my mom would try to work but the problem would be she had no one to leave me with except my dad and so she did go to work for a period of time selling sewing machines because it was like at a Sears she could sit there and she would sew and I think she taught sewing classes again and she got commission for selling the machines and there was a daycare center beside that I remember it being a mall that she worked at and so I don't know how long that lasted I did go to that daycare for a little bit and I did have, you know, that ended because there was an experience where one of the workers like slammed me down in a chair and I told my mom. Some of these situations it's like, but I remember them bringing the worker in in front of my mom and I and having me tell the story and, and you know, just situations you wouldn't put people in. So just saying like my mom had tried, so there was that and then the reoccurring theme, she couldn't find anyone to keep me safe or like she would leave me with my dad. One time she came home and I was drunk. I don't know if I was two and a half, but my dad had been drinking, of course, and apparently I got a hold of his beer or something and she put me in a cold bath and, you know, she said my eyes were rolling back in my head and it was just, you know. So that'll do stuff to you if you just literally have no one that you can trust to leave your kid with back to Sweet Spirit Farm. So I started school. My dad started building a, a garage. He was really good at his craft. They could go and get a totaled car and my dad in his own business at that point would then make it brand new so to speak and then my mom would take it to a car dealership and sell it. That was very profitable. And again, this is a little fuzzy, but my dad borrowed money to build that garage. And I think at some point, I mean, you know, he just stopped paying, paying the money. The first year I went to kindergarten was a private school. Uh, the second year was public school, first grade. And uh, it just seemed like really long days to me. <laughs> I really wanted to be home with my kittens. And I do have some nice memories from that time. My dad would take me fishing. We did have a little boat at one point. It was in a lake area, so we would go out on the lake and my dad would take me fishing. I remember getting like the fishing pole stuck in my hair and my dad trying to get my hair out and him taking me to the little country store and getting me Reese cups and cream soda. There are some nice things. I appreciate that. I guess I also I left another little portion out. My parents were not Christians. They were, I guess you can say, good people. <laughs> my mom had a pretty radical experience in accepting Jesus whenever we lived at the first house deep dark wood. Pretty much like a bolt of lightning from the sky type experience. And also around that time, I started asking my mom if we could go to church and I was probably three or so. There was a lot of stuff swirling, <laughs> a lot of stuff swirling. Real close to our house, there was a new little church that started up. So even in the middle of all that, uh, my parents went to that church. They accepted Jesus, even my, you know, even my dad. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to clean ourselves up and be perfect, right? He takes all people. <laughs> so my dad did accept Jesus. He did have what I would call also a radical salvation experience and I feel that he loved the Lord. We can just go on for years about all the things going on with my dad but I do think that he was sick in his mind and I also know I'm trying to not jump too far ahead in the future in the story but you know if someone is is sick with cancer or sick with other things the Lord doesn't look at them any differently, right? And my dad just had stuff he was sick with. So uh, back to Sweet Spirit Farm. I mean, the alcoholism continued. We would have family down and I just remember like family members, I guess not really knowing what my mom and I were living through. And I remember even, you know, then five, six years old feeling like they were shocked. He was at the table drunk and cursing and they were just like, 
in the corner cowering scared. And I remember it feeling embarrassing. It was a real pretty house and a real pretty property. And outside looking in to a lot of people, it just probably looked like the perfect little family picture. I have well established that it was not. And my dad never, he never hurt me. Um, I don't even remember my dad like yelling at me. I just remember him being really out of control when he drank. And I guess he got, he got violent with, with things, um, not, not with my mom and I. Doesn't make it any better. You know, it's still traumatic if a child is waking up in the middle of the night, hearing mirrors breaking and chairs flying and sounded like pictures being strung off of walls. I mean, it just, all of that is a lot. And it's a lot to, to just be immersed in that when, when you're really little. So anyway, there was a point at Sweet Spirit Farm where it just seemed like maybe that was where we were and that was, life was gonna go on there. And then there was some family property and you know, anytime there's family and property and money and situations where there aren't good boundaries, <laughs> you know, things can get, can slide around and be real slippery real quick. So there were some family members that told my dad that since he was so sick again and basically that he could have his share of an inheritance early in the form of property in a really nice location and that he needed to just go go get that early. And again, I'm, I'm looking down again, I'm looking at this folded napkin again. That's just really all I got for you about that story. Again, there's some things like I have very clear recollection on. I can tell you what a alcoholic rage in the middle of the night sounds like, you know, but that, it just, felt a little smushy to me at the time. Like I knew we were moving. I guess I didn't really know that we were losing the property, um, the Sweet Spirit Farm property. And even then it didn't have to be that way. But again, just trying to make things work. We moved onto that property. This is where like living situation wise, <laughs> things got a little hairy. Yeah, so we moved onto that property. It's a big chunk of land and we moved onto that land in a camper. This is where I feel like some of my Jammer Rell childhood adventure stories begin. There were probably some before, but like real survival stuff. If I wasn't surviving before, and if my mom and I weren't, you know, this is when the real survival stuff starts. So we're on this land, been given, you know, verbally, it's been said to my dad, you can move on to this now, you can have it early, it's gonna be yours one day anyway. We moved the horses there. We dragged those horses around for a very, very long time. We never stopped with the horses. So the horses were taken onto the land and I think they set up electric fencing somehow for them. We lived in a little camper. Um, and of course, my mom, can set anything up lovely. So it was like a little camper that would go onto the back of a pickup truck and we were only a family of three. It didn't have running water. It didn't have heat. We did have one of those, I'll say a kerosene heater. I'm not real sure, I'm, I think that was it. And probably not supposed to use those in a, in a camper, but whatever, don't, don't, do what I'm, don't do what I'm saying. On the day in and day out, I guess you can say we weren't there that much because this is when school became a real yeehaw time for me. Just school felt insane and then life felt insane. And I think I was seven. So in the camper, <laughs> we would sleep there at night. It would be cold. We'd have a lot of covers. We would have whatever makeshift heater. We had jugs of water and my dad just still being who he was would still come home at night in drunken rages, only there wasn't a lot of room in the camper, so I would hear him outside, I guess, throwing sticks and rocks and screaming. And I remember sometimes like him getting a shotgun and shooting in the air and those kind of things. So, and I don't really remember too much else about the camper other than it was winter and we were living in it. Of course, by this point, know that my mom was really sprung because she'd been dealing with this for a really long time and she was trying to make things okay. And she was also, I was in school and she was working and they were trying to get things set up to now 
build on this new property. I remember my dad took me squirrel hunting. <laughs> you know, we shot a squirrel. Uh, I remember, you know, making too much noise with my feet in the leaves. I just remember, I mean, this was like definitely when life, like sun up to sundown, felt like all survival. Like, Part of what was going on is that there were neighbors on the back of this property that would not let us put a road in. And in Virginia, you can't land lock land. Um, so my mom was fighting that. And so what that meant was every day when we came home, we had to park our car and this is a huge property like hundreds of acres we were not getting hundreds of acres but supposedly a big track right still nothing official you can just see see where this is going right but we had to park our vehicle way up by the old original farmhouse and um my mom and i in the mornings we would have to and my dad too we would all have to walk from this trailer on the back of this land across, I mean, I don't know. I don't remember how long it took and I don't remember how many acres it was we had to walk across every day. And this will sound like, you know, when your granddad used to tell the story of how he used to, you know, walk to school with no shoes or whatever, but walk to school in the sh snow barefoot backwards or whatever, but we would get ready with no light, <laughs> with, with, you know, jugs of water. Um, we would bundle up, we would walk way down through this field. Uh, we would come to running water. It would be this big, you know, look, seemed like a river to me. It was not water that we could walk across. There was a log. And um, I just remember, cause I never walked, you know, in or out with my dad. I walked in and out with my mom. So I remember like her and I would have to sit on this log. Many times it would have snow and ice on it. And we would have to scooch across this log on our bottoms. Um, and then that brought us to the cow field. And there were a lot of cows. So then we would have to dodge the cow patties as we're walking up this hill. And eventually at the top of the hill is where the original entrance is and other family property. That's where our cars had to be parked. And then we got to get in the car and go to school and work every day. I'm going to do another video for you just about the school stuff I went through and survival skills I learned with that. It could be helpful for someone. And then how I kind of helped my brain <laughs> when I got out of all that, because that was also a lot. So I had heavy home life stuff and I had heavy school stuff. And my mom and I would then go to a gas station or a fast food bathroom um, to try to get ready for the day again you know, a little better. And then she dropped me off and I'd go to school for the day. Very quickly at that school, I think I was supposed to be in second grade. And just because of life, right? Because of home life, I wasn't going home and doing hours of homework every day. School was a lot for me. Home life was a lot. And that little bit of time that I got home from school before nightfall when my dad would be real drunk <laughs> was kind of like my little bit of childhood time I still had to decompress or whatever you want to call it. And back at Sweet Spirit Farm, you know, we would have some nice times of, I would get off the bus and my mom would be standing there with my pony and my pony would be all saddled up. I mean, you know, again, very, some very, very nice times. Quickly, they realized I was not on grade level. And I don't remember how it all went down, but pretty much in second grade, like just being in second grade a day or two, um, they put me back in first grade. And that was a relief to me. Even now I remember it feeling like a big relief because I remember like my first day of second grade, it wasn't necessarily when school started that year, but I just remember like they were spelling butterfly and that was just, mm -mm, mm -mm, could not do it. So the first day of first grade, the monarch butterfly was hatching from its cocoon. It, it was a different environment, so I was thankful. Now, of course, my mom was working. One of the first jobs she got during that time was at a furniture store, selling furniture, because again, you know, I'm telling you 
his story as a child growing up in this. My mom is a woman and a wife and a mother trying to survive all this and she was concerned if she left my dad because I just I know be gentle on me everyone because I love my mom and my mom loves me and I know whenever I shared the story about when I got beat up in the bathroom I was just trying to tell you all about you know where I got this scar from in my lip and you know I was pretty proud of myself for being young and knowing that wasn't right and you can go back and watch that video or maybe I'll get to it here in our little timeline. Just, you know, advocating for myself at a young age. My mom was concerned that if she left my dad, that there would be family members that would push and fight and had the resources to help fight for my dad to, to get me, basically. So my mom was also playing a survival game and it's really hard when you are living in the middle of really crazy traumatic situations you know hindsight is a great thing right but when you're in the heat of it it can be really hard and so it was hard for my mom to see her way out and as a kid I was fine as long as I had my mom that's what I felt like you know I just remember I was okay as long as I had my mom so with my mom working and me in school and like how you know even in this day and age I mean parents don't get off when school ends so when school would get off I would um, ride the school bus to like an after school type program in town this one wasn't through the school but I did grow up in a lot of after school programs and summer programs and rec and all of that I would go to this after school program and it would be for a while I feel like we played there and we usually had dinner there too. I'm gonna do another video for you about food in particular. <laughs> so I do have some times I was hungry and so that's gonna be a whole other thing I'm gonna share with you about, but I don't really remember breakfast things then. I think my mom and I did like the, the Burger King breakfast sandwich type stuff sometimes, like dollar sandwich or whatever. Lunch was school lunch and dinner was this dinner provided by this after school program. And then my mom would pick me up and it would be dark and we would go back to this big farm property and we would park the car and in the dark, we would walk through the cow field, dodging the cow patties. In the dark, we would then um, scoot across this log with the rushing water underneath and then we would walk what was then back up the hill to the other end of the property where our camper was located. And then, I mean, I wanna say it was like seven or eight o'clock, so it was just a matter of trying to kind of warm the place up and get to bed so we could get up in the morning and do it all over again. That was every day for a while. You know, it might have only really been like three or four months. I don't know really and my mom's not here for me to ask her at this moment so but it was a survival thing i do remember during that time i had mentioned like getting ready in the morning in bathrooms i remember um like going to bathrooms at different times and like washing our hair in the sink and using the hand dryer and my mom bringing in like her blow dryers and you know us trying to like clean up and get ready in bathrooms at some point within all that, the family that had told my dad to go ahead and move to this property and they were going to give it to him and it was gonna be, you know, his early inheritance, he might as well have it. They had decided they just weren't gonna do that. And um, it wasn't that he did anything in particular for them to take it back. They just weren't doing that then. And, we had been surviving out there on that property quite a bit. And so things really came to a head then with my parents and my mom's sister, my Aunt Jo, you know, when we could get to her property, none of this is like next door. So, I mean, it might have been an hour and a half away or something. We would go to her house to shower. Some nights we would spend, my mom and I would spend the night there, you know, to sleep in the bed, sleep in a bed. My Aunt Jo offered for my mom and I to come and stay there. It just wasn't an option for my dad to come and stay because he was gonna be a violent drunk at night and my aunt would not have that. So my mom and I stayed there. My dad went and stayed with family. And I think, you know, initially it was just that 
we were gonna kind of regroup and you know work things out and I switched schools again I might have switched schools three times that year it which is you know just a lot for a kid we lived with my aunt but again we had like food and shower and a bed and um, my mom and I don't know how she worked this out exactly. Of course, it was probably like, I don't know, 1987. So so she got me uh, in a school over near the furniture store where she worked. And uh, I remember I had a really good, still in first grade, <laughs> really good first grade teacher. You know, I don't remember all my teachers, but there's a few that I remember. So this teacher's name, she's probably long been with Jesus because she was an older lady then. Her name was Mrs. Smith. She would have us draw pictures. And I don't think there, there was a fire years later. I don't think we have any of these pictures, but I remember what they looked like. Mrs. Smith was very kind to me and um, very understanding. And she had probably seen a lot of children's pictures. So another, another uh, tissue moment. My pictures were always my mom and I in a chair crying and my dad standing up over us yelling with big angry teeth and like beer. And my mom and I like very small, little in this chair crying. So again, you know, be gentle. <laughs> I know when I shared the bowling alley story, many of the comments wanted to know, well, where was my mom? And my, why didn't my mom do this? And why didn't my mom do that? My mom was in the middle of the storm too. And my mom, you know, next to Travis and Jesus, my mom is my best friend. I am not mad at my mom. We had a lot of yeehaw times. We've had a lot of healing. So that that's just what I want to say. Like, I will not have any comments tearing down my mom. <laughs> and if you're a mom in a hard situation, and I think some of that came out in the comments of the Bowling Alley story, there were some moms who reached out to me who thanked me because they are moms who have been or are in hard situations. They told me it gave them hope that my mom raised me in the middle of a lot of really hard stuff and it gets harder and I guess we can say I'm okay. <laughs> and I say that, I mean, you know, I'm sure none of us are okay and we all have our stories and baggage or whatever you wanna call it. I just, I've tried to have the hard things I've been through, um, again, not trying to be cliche, but uh, it's my story, so. I've tried to be an overcomer and help them make me be better. Some people can grow up in households and like they become that person. I'm 43 and I I don't drink. I think I had one wine cooler <laughs> when I was, you know, a young adult and I have no desire to. There are certainly, you know, I have friends that drink wine. I don't dr judge anyone who drinks alcohol, but because I've seen the other side, like I've seen the devastating life destroying side I don't have any desire to be in any part of that so I don't know where was I friend uh, we were at my aunt's and within that time my mom was you know we were trying yet again getting a plan you know gonna work things out and I think it became apparent that my dad was messing around with some other women you know there was some other heartbreaking stuff going on so then it got to the point where, okay, they were gonna get a divorce. And they were separated for a time. And again, I don't know if this was weeks or months. I just know, you know, every day I was going to school. <laughs> and at that school, I went to another daycare center after school. I was there, I mean, until seven or, I was there late, so gone all day you know early morning at least we weren't uh, you know crossing the river every day on our bottoms but it was a long day i remember my aunt i remember her having like a pink panther coloring book and her and i would color and um <sighs> sorry so many little emotional things um she would like color little spaghetti around their mouth. Like if, I don't know, Pink Panther was eating spaghetti, just really sweet little memories. And like my mom and dad were out trying to have a talk or be on a date. I don't know what the turning point was with my parents. I just know they were separated, we were living apart, 
And then there came a point where we were gonna get back together again. I say we, cause you know, I, I do, I think as an adult, I think of our little family of three. And um, again, we were a family, you know, so. Um, so there's just something really touching about that to me. Just thinking of our little family unit, as crazy as it was, <laughs> you know, we were a little family. So, sorry, just took a break. Now refreshing. I don't know, friends, my bangs keep bothering me. I know, it's like, what, the dingle hopper from Little Mermaid? <laughs> Looking at this little fork in front of me. I need to get my, my bangs trimmed a bit. Anyway, I just I just had to take a little a little emotional breather break. So, parents got back together. Our little family got back together. Uh, we moved into uh, a condo, and really snazzy. It had a gas fireplace. It had a push button fireplace. So we just pushed the button on the wall beside it, and the fireplace came on. It was about this season. So again, my dad could always get an excellent job in his field and his craft. He was working consistently at this time. I mean, he'd always been working, but when you drink and live that kind of life, the money just goes. So, but he was working and my mom got into insurance. And so she got into getting her insurance licenses. Now during this time, I guess I hadn't given you the horse update. I'm trying to remember where they went. So of course we had our horses on the property that didn't work out. I think it was at that point that my mom found a barn in the Northern Virginia area that like we drove by it all the time, but it didn't look in use. I think we boarded our horses there two different times. They were very nice people to us. My mom just pulled in one day and asked the family at that property if she could rent their barn. There was another family, you can keep your horse here situation that lasted just a couple months. Then she went in, none of this, I'm sorry, I know this is like small details uh, that won't matter too much to you. Then she went in and asked that family about boarding her, their, her horse at their barn and using their barn. And I believe that's the first time that we boarded the horses there. And we always called the property by this family's last name. And so I don't want to say that. <laughs> so that's where I'm like, I'm stuttering around. It was just a nice barn on a family property that we drove by all the time and it wasn't in use, but it looked like, you know, good enough condition that it had definitely been used and loved for a long time. I think they were, sympathetic to my mom's situation. I don't know how many details she got into. I do remember it was a husband and wife with grown children and I remember um, different times we would go over and talk to them and like they would bring out the old big doll house in this big library room and I would play with their children's toys that were still there. They also had an in-ground pool on their property and so part of the deal of my mom boarding the horses on the property. And my mom went through and cleaned up the barn and such, but my mom also took care of their pool in the summer. But that also meant I got to swim. So everything I remember about that situation was it was a really nice situation. And so at some point while we were living with my aunt, it's a little bit of fuzzy part, but anyway, we're living in the condo now. The horses are still on that property. I start second grade. Finally, finally, Jim Morrell graduates to second grade. Um, and I know during that time we found a new church and it just felt like a renewal time. Like our little family was trying to pull itself back together. Uh, I feel like there was a big period of time where my dad was not drinking. I remember being homesick one day and my dad coming home and praying for me. I remember some nice times where he wasn't drunk. Cause you know, that just really affects a family's evening. So, so I do have some good me memories of my dad not drinking and us going to a new church and getting involved and like my mom making, you know, hand sewing. I think it's raining really hard. Cue the rain. <laughs> uh, my mom hand sewing all the costumes for the Christmas play and the Easter play. And I remember at some point we stopped going and I remember the pastor 
and uh, some of the other men of the church coming over and knocking on the door and my dad not wanting to answer the door. So again, I think at that point, I was eight probably. Enter in at some point, enter in gambling, enter in the racetracks. So I remember uh, starting to spend a lot of weekends going to the racetracks or my dad would go to the racetrack. Um, then within a certain period of time, and again, my timeline is fuzzy, I just remember things like um, my dad not having money for the rent and um, there just being a lot of money lost gambling. And, you know, sometimes we would go to the racetrack and if my dad would win, you know, we would eat out on the way home. And if he didn't win, well, we would just have to get home. There was a whole lot of that. I think we were there at that condo for, it must have been a year. I think I started and finished school in that one school that one year, which was a big deal. <laughs> I mean, I guess for kindergarten, I was in the same school. And then first grade, I think I must have did my whole first grade year in the same school, but then the second grade and the first grade started moving schools then. And so I wanted to say we lived in that condo for about a year. Uh, that's funny, it's actually when I met my first homeschool family and um, they were from Oklahoma and they were living there and the kids homeschooled. And I'm pretty sure I told those kids that homeschooling was illegal. And the kids said, well, we're not under Virginia law, we're under Oklahoma law. <laughs> so, I mean, again, I was all of eight and I didn't know anything about homeschooling. <laughs> so in that condo apartment complex, I made real good friends with a boy named Tony. And I made real good friends with my friend Kelly, who her mom later beat me up at the bowling alley. I just made some good, like good kid friends there. And we rode bikes together and went to the playground together. And I don't know if I told you this story or not, but our playground was like the paint was chipping off it and such, kind of like the paint is chipping off my nails here. And I just remember one day I got this idea, well, I'll take some of my mom's paints and I'll just paint the playground. So I did, I gathered up a bunch of paints and I took it down and I painted the playground and then these older kids came and told me that the police were gonna come because I painted the playground and then I went back home crying. My mom was worried. She was worried someone had hurt me or something and she was so relieved when I said, I painted the playground. And so she said she had to try not to laugh. Anyway, we lived there. My dad was still drinking and he might've been gambling before, but in my childhood that living there is when I remembered the gambling entering in into our lives because it causes a lot of problems coming up. It caused a lot of problems there. I remember, you know, going to the landlord's house and my dad going in and I don't know how many months he got behind and my mom was working in a new career, getting her insurance licenses and basically my dad would gamble away his good paycheck and my mom would have to figure out how to carry us. And so fast forward to the end of that year and school was okay that year. I had a lot of, you know, latchkey kid stuff. I don't think we started the latchkey stuff. I wasn't staying home by myself yet. I don't think, maybe a little. I think it was an after school program. And I know that summer I was in the after school program that the school held every day. At some point though, we had to move and we moved to another property in another city in Northern Virginia. There was a lot of drinking and gambling going on. I was at another school and I think that year is when I felt like I was getting touches of the bullying. Kids will be kids or whatever, but that year, third grade, I had highs and lows and I felt like the bullying was really starting. So we had a house we rented, the horses went from the barn that we were boarding them in to the house that we rented had some property and again I don't know the details like how we were able to go from this apartment condo situation to another property I guess you just start over again in another nearby town always trying to make it work my dad got very sick again living at this next property and he had I'm gonna say like some sinus facial surgeries which was probably related to his smoking he also always smoked so his beer of choice was Coors Light and his cigarettes were Winston that was the house that we lived at when you know the one weekend my mom went away with my aunt her sister was the weekend that my friend's mom beat me up at the bowling alley 
and I'll link that story down below if you want to go down memory lane with me. And my dad was drunk, he could not come pick me up. So that's just, uh, you know, another story, right? So I know while we lived there, uh, my mom's Arabian stallion got very sick and he just laid down in the garage. I remember she was crying and it was very upsetting I and mean, she had had him a very long time. And so she just started to hose him down because, you know, it had been raining and something. I, again, I forget all the details, so I'm, I might be saying something incorrectly. But she was just saying that if he was going to die, he was going to be clean. But by the end of her cleaning him up, he got up and he lived. <laughs> he lived after that. I believe it was at that property where we had to downsize the horses again. We had been moving them around a while. And I believe it was at that property when my mom finally had uh, another farm come and take high voltage away so he could go be breeding stock at their farm. And um, that was very sad for her, you know, very emotional for her because she was very connected with him. And he screamed from the horse trailer all the way down the road. I believe it was at that farm that we finally sold my pony. We've been hauling my pony around all those years. I, even though I grew up, you know, we had these horses. If you can tell by the story that I have been sharing with you, I didn't have time to do anything with horses. Some people will say things to my mom even today like, oh, it's, you know, it's a shame your daughter never got into horses. I didn't have the opportunity. Even though we had them, every day was survival. Every day was go to work, go to school, come home, try to hold your brains in. Dad's spending the grocery money and the rent money at the horse track, and it's gonna be up screaming drunk tonight. It, it wasn't time for riding lessons, you know. My children have riding lessons, but I didn't have riding lessons. And my mom, besides feeding the horses and caring for the horses, you know, before I was born, she was in all the horse shows, doing all the horse things. And then after I was born, as I had shared, we still had the breeding farm and she did continue with that for a little bit. And then things just got real wild. Um, so all that to say, downsize horses again. I think we had maybe one horse still when we did the next move. And I believe I was about to turn nine during this. The next move we moved from Northern Virginia, and if you're not familiar with Virginia, the whole DC metro area, the area around DC, like Falls Church and Fairfax and Herndon, you know, used to be the country, and now that's where Dulles Airport is, and it's all big city, but Centerville, all of those are the little cities that we moved around, and it's also the area where my parents grew up back when it was the country, so we had family and such there. And during all of this, you know, people might ask, where was our family helping us? So I did have that, that one aunt, my mom's sister, my Aunt Jo, she did try to help. Like she would visit and maybe bring my mom new clothes. I would go spend a week with her, excuse me while I scratch my arm, I would spend a week with her and I would go to vacation Bible school. She took me to vacation Bible school every day. She tried to help how she could and she always listened to my mom and tried to you know, emotionally support my mom through all the things she was going with, through and she was good to me, which is a blessing. But there wasn't any other family involved in our situation if they, saw what was happening, you know, no one else was offering any help. And, and a lot of times people don't know how to help. They don't know what to say. A lot of times when you're in hard situations, you don't know how to ask for help. So it's pretty much, you know, my mom and I and the occasional support of this aunt. Anyway, so the next move, we moved from these city locations to the country, actually not too far from where my, me and my family live now and where we have lived for quite a while. So we moved out to the country and I started fourth grade in this general area, um, other side of the mountain, but anyway, uh, and we rented, it was a little blue house, but it was a duplex and we lived in a little apartment in the bottom and of course give you the house layout you know you walk it had a little porch and and i still drive my kids by this little house from time to time 
that's where my little family of three was and so you walk in the little porch door and there was a little precious kitchen and like a little it was probably supposed to be like an eat-in kitchen nook but we kind of put a couch there and used that as our little living room little bathroom and then it did have a big living room and my mom decorated that very nice and we did get a piano there and had two bedrooms and so while living there there were several really nice things we tried and so meanwhile my dad was again serious heavy drinking and serious heavy gambling my mom had grown in her insurance career that she had one person above her and they were just like tell us what you want and when they realized i think at that point my parents commuted from Shenandoah Valley, rural Virginia, up to Northern Virginia, like where where were they commuting to? Past Manassas. So anyway, they were commuting like hour and a half or more, two hours plus, depending on the traffic. And so my mom's boss was like, at the time, she was driving an older car. And so when he finally put together how much she was commuting, he bought her like a brand new Toyota Celica. And it had, uh, we pushed the button and it had electric sunroof, that's what it's called. And it was black and it was, it was just sharp and fancy. And my f good friend and I would like stand up out of the sunroof and sing, not necessarily while the car was moving, but you know, it, it was a big deal. She was making a, a good income for whatever a good income would have been in, I don't know, I don't think we were, it was 1989. I was nine though and born in 79. It probably was 88, 89. And I don't know what that income was. Maybe it was $7 an hour then. Maybe it was $15 an hour then. But I just know she was saving money. She was making a good income. Her boss bought her a car so she could get to work every day. I went to school every day. I went to the babysitter after school for a while. That our whole first summer there, I spent that summer between two different babysitters. Other stories there. Um, and then when school started, we tried with the babysitter for a while, for a week, <laughs> for a short time. And then we just went to, I was nine then, and I mean in 1989, I don't know what the child stay at home from the school bus laws or rules are these days, but there were kids, plenty of kids then that got off the bus and they went home and they were by themselves until their parents got home. So that's what my life was then. School all day, got off the bus, walked home to that little blue house, locked myself in that house, and I was there for three to four hours by myself watching TV. And I just had the TV shows memorized. I, I think it was Oprah and the news and whatever game shows would come on. And at some point around seven or eight, maybe my parents would get home. And my mom would try to cook a little dinner, like, you know, a little hamburger patty, a little something. Or sometimes my dad even cooked. I know, you know, just the, the scrambled memories, but he actually was a good cook and sometimes he would cook. Many times not, but I mean, it would, it would happen sometimes. That was also when we had oh, just other weird things. Like if there was orange juice, I wasn't allowed to drink it because my dad needed it for his mixed drinks. When I would get home from school, I don't remember there being like food there. Like, I mean, yes, there could have been half a loaf of white bread and maybe there was a couple eggs and my dad's alcoholic beverages. Maybe the raw hamburger that my mom was, you know, there just, there wasn't food there for me. It always felt like scrounging around trying to figure out what I could eat. So now I make a lot of spaghetti sauce. My mom's mom came to, she was in her 80s, I believe at that point and her health was declining and there was a point when she came to stay with us also because I was gone at school all day and my mom was gone at work all day and my dad was gone at work also. You know, it's just the funny thing, like he, he went to work every day, but it's just amazing how some people can, you know, fall apart at home but still show up and go to work every day. So she stayed with us for a little bit. It was kind of like long trips. We wanted her to live with us at some point, but I'm sure she had, you know, dementia in some form. She would just get out and start wandering. And we had a wonderful retired doctor couple that we rented this property from. 
and they were just very good to us and I think they're just another set of people along the way who could sniff out what my mom and I were going through. And so they were very good to me. They had a very nice new in-ground swimming pool and they lived just down the little road from us. And so I think this is where I got one of my little parenting rules, but basically I could not ask to swim. I had to be invited. So I think they had that rule with all the neighborhood kids so that and they would invite kids all the time to swim, but you had to wait to be invited. And I have kind of like when we go to stores and stuff, I'll tell my kids that I will offer things, but I don't want them, you know, just the constant gimme, gimme, gimme stuff, right? You want your kids to feel like they can ask you for things. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that just like some basic parameters with little kids and the gimme's, right? Like the neighborhood kids and everybody wants to swim every day. Just, just have a, some basic framework there. Another thing, um, and that's where we got to the piano, so I am not a pianist by any means. Again, everything always got to feeling too unstable for me to pretty much stick with anything. But a really nice attempt was this doctor that we rented from had a piano, and him and his wife were letting my mom know and hooking us up with a local piano teacher, and they were letting me go to their house to practice the piano. They, I think they decided I should do the piano. <laughs> so, uh, and at some point, and I think they probably found it for us, we got a piano that fit in that living room. And I didn't practice, and I didn't particularly want to do piano, but you know, I, I did a little bit. Uh, they also got me in the bell choir at their church. It was the handbells that we rang. We wore little gloves and learned different little songs there. So those were like some good happy things. Also with my mom's job, I remember, and I didn't, sh I just so many little, little things to, to share with you here, but when we lived at the condo, I remember like, you know, thrift store Christmas, like just, preparing myself that there would be nothing for Christmas in the morning and, and that was going to be okay and coming around the corner and being thrilled because this Barbie dream house that was at the thrift store for $20 was there and my mom had gotten the money from my aunt and had somehow got that Barbie dream house there for me and my aunt was always good about getting me little things you know not overly extravagant but like I remember you know opening um a little purple poodle, she liked poodles, you know, bubble bath, and maybe some drawing supplies and nail polish, so kinds of like girly self-care things. The little blue house, I had a, a full Christmas there. I wanted an aquarium, and I got that, and uh, some, other, some other special material type things, but my dad was continuing to spiral there. And I remember one morning waking up to the sound of rushing water a few days after Christmas, somehow like the whole bottom, it was a nice aquarium setup. The whole aquarium was all over my room. And so <laughs> my mom handled that. Uh, we had to get replacement fish and such. And I made a very good best friend, Heather, that year. And we had all kinds of adventures from that time, like all the way to young adulthood, growing up together. Very good when you can pick up a good friend along the way. And her home felt like a very nice stable home to me. She had two parents that worked and like they did little vacations and they had a pantry and like lots of things in the refrigerator and meals together and what uh, this was during the waterbed era so like there were three kids in her family and each of them got a waterbed and each of them had a ferret and each of them had a bike and each of them had roller skates it was just like the parents were trying to do the little things for each of the kids they had a chore list in the hall i remember like opening their bathroom closet and there would be three shampoos there and three conditioners. So whenever you finished one, there would be another one there. Her mom gardened. They were the family that in years down the road, I would end up spending several summers with them. And we would do things like go tubing and go shopping for back to school clothes. And just some of those things that in the turmoil, the survival turmoil I was living in, you know, we didn't do just because we were surviving every day. And so, I know I went to fourth grade there, and I think I started fifth grade there. 
and again had adventures with friends and babysitters and um, I think it was that following summer the summer of fourth grade I still wasn't reading uh, I definitely was not reading well I think I could write my name but you know all the times of moving and such I mean I'm sure now as an adult woman in my 40s you know if you want to go down like the list of uh, my plastic salad knife here you know list of things I had I'm sure you know severely dyslexic and among other things I wasn't put in special education yet but I was definitely very far behind and so that summer of fourth grade we had had a hard summer with babysitters the summer before like again it was a situation of no matter how much my mom seemed to pay these different sitters it was always you know something so that next summer however it came about my mom quit her job and uh I think it was the buildup of my dad's gambling increasing and the drinking and his it was making it very easy like all his money was just continually being gone and you know again don't blame my mama lots of women find themselves in crazy situations right and so she was just in this crazy situation and then there I was like we couldn't find good childcare, and I was nine and gonna turn 10 and going into fifth grade and I, I still couldn't read basic readers and again all those years and all those schools I mean schools try and when kids move a lot it's hard but I did have some schools like I did a whole year in, and I was just always passed along and I would try to pay attention like I remember in fourth grade because my friend Heather was a good student I remember modeling her but my reading wasn't there. I remember um, like writing the word hurt and spelling it H-E-R-T and like the kids laughing at me and stuff because I sounded it out. Hurt, you know, H-E-R, hurt, T. Okay. So when my mom quit her job, she, um, she, of course, then our income was gone. She did have a savings padded up. Um, which lasted a little bit and then that summer we went to the lake all the time same lake I take my kids to all the time now and uh, we got library cards we went to the library a lot and I just I remember like working through insect books and such I don't remember like a phonics curriculum and I remember my mom trying to help me even before that summer that school year different nights trying to help me with my homework and I just remember being hours because by fourth grade there was homework I remember me crying I just it was a lot anyway by that summer she was trying to help me and my reading did improve some and again we had a nice summer and I knew she wasn't working and so I remember us like going to the thrift store and they would have free squash and zucchini and we would take those and fry them up with butter and eat them and I just remember us having to get creative. I think our landlord, there's probably a lot behind the scenes with my dad he had been dealing with and so somewhere around the start of fifth grade we moved and there was another barn up the road from this little blue house that we kept the one or two horses at and um, my dog and some of the cats and our, our goat that we had also hauled around, Nana Goat. We ended up living in a hotel, like one of those, I want to say like $35 a night hotels, I don't know, like pay for, pay for by the week. Just like a real hole in the wall hotel in a little bit bigger city area, maybe 30 or so minutes away. And then I remember going to another school another school situation there um, and like the kids were nice to me the first week until I went to a slumber party and then things kind of changed at the slumber party and they were mean to me after that but again I, I wasn't like living in normal kids circumstances there was also again my mom always trying there was some land she was trying to buy or she had bought bought but you know on payments and we still didn't have a way to build a house on it but again like trying how, how do we figure this out right i remember a couple hotel moves in every hotel like my mom was bringing in beautiful pictures you know my mom was decorating and again we were trying but it's just hard to try with like how long do you try with someone who was living like how my dad was living and he was still drinking you know he always had beer he always had cigarettes he always had money to gamble fuzzy chain of events for me as a kid 
there were some sleeping in the car nights too. Things were just feeling sketchier than normal. Within all that, my grandma got down, like down, bedridden down. My mom and I ended up moving up to temporarily, but coincidentally we needed a place to stay, so that was good. Um, and not like a big discussion before, we're gonna come live with you and take care of mom. It just kind of happened. You know, we went and we stayed some and my mom started helping take care of her. That's where I went at kind of middle of fifth grade in there. That particular fifth grade teacher, not that she was necessarily super wonderful. A wonderful thing she did is I remember like my first day of class, she was reading aloud to the class and that obviously has stuck with me and she was reading aloud uh, the book with bells on their toes. I remember her reading through at least the first Narnia book. She just always had a read aloud going and even if it was 15, 20 minutes after lunch every day. She read aloud to the class and that was phenomenal. I remember at that school, I started talking to the school counselor. You know, they would get worried about the stories that I would tell them and there would be times that my mom would have to go in and talk to them. When I was telling them those stories about, you know, living in the camper with no running water and um, hotels and car, what, whatever. The various stories are that I have shared with you. You know, we had a place to live at my granddad's and running water and such. So there really wasn't anything for them to do other than this kid has been through some stuff, right? And it was in school there that they finally started testing me for learning disabilities. And I remember them giving me a choice to go in the special ed class or to stay in a regular classroom. And it didn't take long for the regular classroom to just feel really torturous. And the special ed classroom only had like six or seven kids. It felt like a weight off my shoulders when I got to go in the special ed classroom because my grandparents' house wasn't a perfect situation either. <laughs> and I still, like my dad wasn't living there and I was okay because I was with my mom. But yeah, I, I'm like, uh, I'm trying to unpack as much of these stories with you as I can in this one video. As far as going into special education, it felt comfortable for me. It was less pressure. I got more help. There wasn't any snickering or belittling because I was way behind in math and reading and if I misspelt things, it was a good pace for me. Kind of felt like, you know, I guess you could say like homeschooling. I had uh, went from 30 to 40. These were Fairfax County public schools, if that means anything to anyone back in the day. And so like they were really full classrooms. So I went from 30 to 40 kids and one teacher to six or seven kids and a teacher. And sometimes she had an aide. It was good. It was good for me. I don't know, you know, what the papers said as far as learning disabilities and such. I just knew, I felt like I could survive a little better in that environment. We still got together with the main class for lunch and for PE. And it's funny, that's the school that I was also in band at, like a little normal try, right? And so I was in band and we rented an instrument. I'm trying to think what I... Played. I think maybe it was the trumpet. I mean, I wasn't actually learning how to play it. I had the instrument, I went to band practice, but I wasn't following like, you know, reading the notes and such. Because again, to really learn those kind of things, it takes time and effort outside of school. And my outside of school time experience was always wild or it wasn't and I was just able to breathe for a minute. But that was the school that, it was band practice one day. I didn't realize, I'm trying to remember it in my mind. If I close my eyes, I will remember it. It was band practice one day. What I figured out later is that band practice kids need to go to band practice. And if you weren't in band practice, you go outside to play kickball. And I mean, believe me, I hated playing kickball, but <laughs> I didn't get the memo that I was supposed to go to band that day. So I went outside with everyone was playing kickball teachers came and found me very upset and very angry that they had been searching for me and they could not find me. I was taken to the principal's office. I was given a lot of stern talking to's. I kept telling them 
I didn't know I thought I was supposed to be here. Nobody believed me. They put me in detention for the next week. It was in a closet. And so they put my, like my desk in this brick closet with coats and I had to sit there every day and do my schoolwork. But I liked it because I actually got to be alone. Even though I was in the special ed classes, this was like another level. I just remember as a kid feeling like, well, something about this doesn't feel right. I mean, I'm telling you, I didn't know. I honestly didn't know. No one's believing me and I'm in detention in this closet. So that was also the school where I started seeing that kids were getting breakfast in the morning and I was trying to figure out how to get in on that school breakfast. I couldn't quite figure it out. Yeah, so our living situation at that time was not that we didn't have food. It's just, it wasn't like a meal. It was like scrounging around and, you know, maybe there's some cornflakes, maybe there's some white bread. All these things are fine, especially if you're a hungry kid. These are not things that I'm complaining about. But I just remember like there wasn't a meal prepared. There wasn't a meal like this is what your breakfast options are or hey today we're sitting at a cereal station so get cereal and set bowls out. And those are things that are obviously important to me as an adult. But again we'll get, in, we'll get into that more in another video. But I just remember at that school realizing there was a, a breakfast option and not being able to not feel like how do I get that? Because then you can go to a school breakfast as I learned later in later schools and like, you know, there's cereal uh, or there might be a muffin, a banana, and you can get two things of milk, you know, real fancy, all about them school meals. So my mom took care of her mom while we lived there. My granddad was also independent, a brilliant man, very set in his ways. There were people he was not good to, but he was good to me. I'm just, you know, it's such like a, feels like a Howard Hughes type situation. He was a scientist of sorts and retired from the Pentagon and um, had invested in properties all over Northern Virginia back in the day when everything was the country and had a lot of impressive things. He chose to live like if people would see him out, they would think that he was homeless. If there was a part that you could buy at the auto parts store, you know, he was gonna make it. He would have duct tape on his door handles of his car. He wore the same dirty clothes a lot. So he was an interesting character, okay? But again, like I remember when I was little, he thought I should learn Spanish and so I was like, three or four, I have had a been older than three. We'll say I was four, four-year-old Jim Rowe. I remember him taking me to the record store and buying me a Spanish record. <laughs> so he was just another interesting character in this life of what makes Jim Rowe, Jim Rowe. He was not always good to my grandma. She's in heaven with Jesus. She would have her own wildlife stories of living with that man. It was good that we were there taking care of her so that she would get the care that she needs. And it coincided with, again, my mom and I needing a place to live. This house that we lived in was a beautiful stone ranch on an acre or so. And it was the property that my granddad had bought brand new when my mom was three. So like they had lived in it for a long time. He was also a car guy. The cars were deep and wide there. Um, I mean, he had a lot of really nice collectible, special collectible things there, but it just looked like a bunch of junk. And the house had had a fire years before and had since been repaired but like it was livable things were just dirty it felt like a a dirty home so i was a child living in this very dirty home when my mom and i moved in you know my mom as she was able because my granddad you know he was just a special kind of guy she started cleaning things and, and moving things and trying to organize things and my grandma's hospital bed was in the middle of the living room. My mom had not worked in nursing yet, that comes up in the future, but you know, my mom learned a lot of good nursing skills there and had to do total care. She had to feed her mom, get her mom in and out of bed every day. My mom brought help in 
the physical therapist would come and work with my grandma. My mom would get her up in her wheelchair every day, get her in a new nightgown. She was paralyzed on part of her body at this point, but with her one hand that she could, she'd get her little sandwiches that my mom would have there. And my mom had a little black and white TV there for her. And so she'd watch through like I Love Lucy and Andy Griffith's show and uh, Beverly Hillbillies. And you know, she had like a little routine of care there. Also during that time, things that started to become important in public school were like clothing and name brands. And as adults, we know those things aren't important, but with these city kids, it became important. And it's funny, it's like the things that are cool again now, like the champion t-shirts and such, you know, we were doing that back then, friends. Anyway, the Nikes and the, uh, back then it was the Umbro shorts. I didn't have any of that. And uh, I had very much whatever was at the thrift store or whatever was hand me down from some much older cousins, like their old, old stuff. Just the picking on what I wore every day to school was became a thing. I was making some friends kind of and able to survive my school days better being in the smaller classroom special education setting. And then my grandma died. I keep taking breaks while filming this. I don't know how long we are to get to this part of the video, but I have been sitting here talking this part for almost two and a half hours so far. <laughs> and we're only to the part where I am uh, in fifth grade. So as I say, Jim Ralph has lots of stories to share, but I just refilled my water. Mm -hmm. I still have my comfort napkin and I still have my other napkin where I'm working on sometimes picking off my nail polish. So we're getting through it. Thank you. Let me just say thank you so much if you have listened to this point. I really appreciate it. I think having people to listen to our stories is important as well. Um, please feel free to take a break if you need it. This this is your reminder to go go refill your water cup if you need to, okay? We're we're in for the long haul here. So we stayed and we and I'm looking over to check on a camera battery that cuz somehow I'm here with <laughs> two batteries that need to be charged and only one charger. Anyway, we're getting through it. Uh we took care of my grandma. So again, everything in that situation, I was okay with because I had my mom. Um, let's see, that was all of fifth grade. Summer of fifth grade was okay. <laughs> Trying to think, no, no major, uh, I mean, besides the situation that we were living in, just, you know, unconventional with my granddad being a character and, you know, like all the kids in school knew the house that I lived in because it was like the junkyard house. So that and, oh, I, I know where I left off before my last little break here. Uh, so about, you know, the clothes and just things that, that start to matter or started to matter to me. And uh, the horses, we were still hauling around horses. They were back at that really nice couple's farm with the pool that we had had them at a few years before. So they, um, don't worry, the animals were there. <laughs> so then my grandma died. And I think by that point, and again, I'm trying to share as much of my backstory as possible and be gentle on my mom and anyone else involved because it was just all over crazy, right? And again, hindsight, we can always look at something and say, oh, well, I see that clearly here from the other side of it. So what you should have done is this, this, and this, and it would have all been fine. But again, when you're in the, the middle of the mess, it's very hard to see your way out and uh, to see up from down and left from right and all of that. So during all this time, my dad, he had lived with his parents for a while. At some point he got an apartment and my parents were separated at that point. When my grandma died, I think that now as an adult, I see that my mom just kind of sprung, right? And so we give her lots of grace in that because the woman had been dealing with stuff for decades. For me as a kid, it wasn't easy, but I'm just saying like as a grown woman in my 40s, I can look and see, wow, that woman was in some stuff. And as an adult woman, you know, I've been married 24 years now, I'm 43 years old. 
I have not been in or lived in the stuff that she was living in as an adult and trying to operate and she loved my dad and uh, even though you know I had shared there were times she was being wise where she would just she would have left but she was concerned about me and those kind of things and again if you're a grown woman you know things are complicated things get complicated so during that time after my grandma died there was I don't know how else to jump into this there was a night when my mom didn't come home got to back up a little bit this actually started <laughs> a little bit before before my grandma died, there started to be times where then my mom wasn't coming home at night. So I would stay up all night because there was no one, it was not a situation where I was being cared for, where anyone, again, was making me meals or tucking me in bed um, or even telling me to go to bed. Like my granddad, who again, wore the same clothes for weeks at a time, and my grandma, who was bedridden in the bed, they weren't there taking care of me. It was weird. Like the first couple times, I was just like, okay, that was weird. But then I started to see a pattern where I would get home from school and I would know my mom had been there. My grandma had been cared for and I didn't see my mom. And so she was only coming during the day to take care of her mom. And so that was really hard on my little 10 year old brain. I didn't know what to make of that. I felt stuck. I still had to get up and go to school every day. Um, I had to dress myself, you know, I had, I mean, obviously at 10 you do that as a kid, but just saying like, I was there alone then in a very weird situation. Then my grandma died and then my mom just stopped coming home for weeks at a time. So I was there with my granddad who like I say he was good to me in that like he never hurt me but he was very elderly and um, probably should not have been driving and um, my mom wasn't there to clean things up everything was very dirty and I didn't have clean clothes and at some point something happened like in their bathroom this was just such a like older grandparent thing in their bathroom was like my grandma's dry shampoo from the 70s <laughs> like there was some old beauty products in that bathroom which is fascinating like a museum right and at some point i remember taking a shower or trying to take a bath and i didn't mean to but you know again it was an old house the drain broke on the bathtub so my granddad's answer to that was he turned the water off i i couldn't shower or take a bath and that's at the age where like a kid needs to. So I knew my bathing in the sink tricks from bathing in the gas stations. I didn't have deodorant and somewhere I had heard about baking soda. And so I would try to put baking soda in my armpit area, but it would make big sores. I know I am sharing a lot and I really hope that it is helpful in that, you know, I'm here today and um, I have been married a long time. I have been home raising my children. I have accidentally started a business on the internet with $20 over a decade ago and have been supporting my family of now 11 for a long time. Like I'm a, again, I keep hearing the song and the songs in my head. I'm either, either hearing Overcomer by Mandisa or I'm hearing that I'm a survivor. I'm not going to give up a song, but those are just the songs that come to mind. And for those of you who want to know like the JMRL origin story. <laughs> this, these are all parts of ha how I am who I am. Okay. Uh, the kids started making fun of me every day because I stank. And again, I know I was in like so old, dirty clothes. No one at my school was helping me or like I was under the radar. No one was noticing. This is a, another food situation. Like I was getting school lunch. I don't remember eating breakfast. That was still the mystery. And when I got home, these are just very specific, like dinner memories. I had to figure out what I was gonna eat for dinner. And so now there were family members who would come and bring my granddad food. And you know, like if he had ginger ale, I would drink some of the ginger ale that was there. Or if they had brought him coffee cake, I would have a piece of the coffee cake. But again, like I was just under everybody's radar. No one was really like, okay, there's this 10 year old girl living in this dirty house and 
she doesn't have water, she didn't have deodorant, and she'd really like some breakfast, and um, no one's taking care of her. So we'll see if I end up leaving this part of these parts of the story in the video. Time will tell. So I developed a little dinner routine. And my little dinner routine is uh, somehow we would have white rice and I don't know what bowls were available because again whatever was in the kitchen was left from my grandma's homemaking days and she had gone to be with Jesus and she wasn't homemaking and making meals for I don't know at least 15 years at that point maybe longer so I remember like from the mar the margarine containers there were some empty margarine containers there and so I figured out how and I still don't know how I figured this out but I'm so glad I did I figured out how to cook my white rice you know put my rice in there add my water in there and cook it and you know those are flimsy plastic you know cook it in those margarine containers in an old microwave and there would usually be like cans of peas or a can of corn. And so I would cook my rice. I would open the one can of peas or the one can of corn. And many times there was some kind of margarine and salt and pepper, uh, sometimes a little garlic powder. And I would put that whole can of peas in there with that rice and with the butter and with the salt and pepper and maybe a little garlic powder. And that would be my dinner. And that was my dinner for every night for a very, very long time. There were just all, there was just always rice and some kind of canned vegetable. And I know that that is a blessing. I just also know as a kid, it would have been nice for someone to make me dinner. <laughs> so, you know, just uh, things you, you think about, right? I have had a hard time when my girls in particular have been around that age because I just think of how I was alone fending for myself at that age. And I've looked at them at those ages and just think, that's just very young to be fending for yourself. And we all know there's children who fend for themselves much younger. But again, this is my story and I felt like I didn't have a voice. I felt like no one would hear me. I felt like no one cared that I was I was the dirty kid, the stinky kid, you know, the can I say the smelly kid, the kid without water to take a proper shower or bath in and I was scared at night. I was so I was so so scared. I would stay up with my granddad. You know, cuz again, he was older, so he stayed up and watched TV as soon as I got home from school, so I wasn't going to daycare or the children's program, I would go home and as soon as I would come in the door, I would sit with him and we watched the four o'clock news, and we watched the five o'clock news, and at some point I made my rice and my peas, and at some point he went out there and he fumbled around and found himself something. So it's kind of like, I want to say we were two homeless people living together, but I mean, we. We made this little life together. We were each other's company. After the news, all the uh, evening game shows started, like Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. And then, depending on the day of the week, you know, we had the TV guide, so he had the TV shows planned out for every night. And um, if my mom would have been there, you know, at some point, her and I would have gone to bed, but she wasn't. And it was just a big old dirty house. And again, it was nice that I had someone to sit and watch TV with. But another thing that I did is that friend Heather I made in fourth grade, I called her a lot and it was long distance. So my granddad got this, it was a rotary phone. And so he got this lock on the phone. So I could make local calls, but I couldn't make long distance calls. So it's, again, it was just kind of like any little thing, any little bit of joy I would find, you know, my outlet would be, well, I would call Heather and talk to her for an hour or two, and that would be something. I couldn't do that. So he would probably go to bed about 11 or midnight, and I would be so petrified to go to sleep. I would try to fall asleep in the chair before he would go to bed. You know, that would be my goal. But I had just sat for hours, you know, no physical exercise since 4 p.m. when I had gotten off the school bus. So a lot of times I was awake and I would just be 
sitting up in that chair petrified all night. Didn't have cable or anything, so usually at midnight the TV shows stop. Sometimes new ones would start at 2 a.m. And I would just try to have whatever kind of broken sleep I could have until the light came out and then I knew I had to get myself ready to go to school. And I would ride the bus and the kids would make fun of me. I would go to school, the kids would make fun of me. Lunchtime was my favorite part of the day because then, you know, like I loved school lunches because it was like a little prepared meal. So like it was the little school lunch pizza and the box of chocolate milk and the little side item and you know, maybe the small little piece of cake or something. So I just endured. But again, when I, I was in special education, so that made it a little better and rode the school bus back and then at four watched tv and ate dinner at some point and again my mom would show up um every once in a while again we just know and how i just have to leave it is she was sprung she thought i was okay whatever we whatever we want to say I just kind of will just put that on the shelf over here my story that i'm focusing it on is i was a kid and for all intents and purposes, I was alone. At some point I realized no one really was watching me and no one was taking care of me and I could kind of do what I wanted. Now, <laughs> I never got too many big deep ideas. You know, I was only allowed to drive, to ride my bike up and down the driveway. Well, once I realized that instead of sitting and watching TV for eight hours or 12 hours I started riding my bike down the sidewalk and then I started riding my bike through the neighborhood next door and at some point I was like you know what if I ride my bike way up that way and then way down that way there's like a shop the shopping centers and there's fast food restaurants so then my granddad had big containers of pennies and coins and change and so I would just started to take every time I went by I would get a handful of change put it in my pocket and I'd save it up for a few days and I just kept riding my bike farther and farther I know Jesus protected me and I would ride it had to have been miles and it was a little huffy bike I'd ride all the way to this Wendy's and I would get a water and I would get a baked potato with butter and sour cream and chives because it was 99 cents or something like that and I would sit in there and eat it and then there was a pet store and I would walk in the pet store and I would buy a little mouse. <laughs> I mean I would do this like every week and I would bring the little mouse home. I would keep the little mouse, because the, the little mouse, every week the mouse would get out. So I only ever would have one of these mice in my drawer. And I would put this week's new mouse in my drawer and keep it for the week. And I would not ride my bike to the Wendy's every day, but I tried to do it as often as possible. And again, it was just, that was my destination, the Wendy's and the pet store and then getting back home. At some point, I signed up for some little, then maybe you ladies remember these, they were like these little magazines you could sign up for, but you could be a sales rep even as a kid, and you could win prizes based on how much you sold. So I remember taking that through the neighborhood, trying to sell things. I do remember like a positive thing that happened is I became a patrol officer on the bus. We wore the orange sashes, we had the badge, and I also got the golden badge. I was patrol officer of the month. I know, I know, I, you are looking at patrol officer of the month. And that was nice. And uh, I had a couple friends I had made during that time. My one friend lived in a very nice house and she kept wanting to have me over and like they had a refrigerator that had like soda choices in it and uh, i remember going over there and we had like a wedding for her guinea pigs and you know, we would go to the pool you know it was just it was probably only four or five times i did things with her but um that was nice i also had another friend i made actually two different friends during that time one was jessica and one was janelle and I'm still Facebook friends with Janelle. I've lost track of Jessica over the years. But Jessica's family, they lived in a townhouse. They had four kids. 
and they had meals. <laughs> you know, they had, you know, like, I don't know, spaghettis for dinner tonight or chicken or something. They were there having meals every day. So I'm getting into some more of my self-taught survival skills, but so the one thing is I realized no one was really watching me or pay, no one was paying attention, so I got the freedom to just ride my bike. Now again, this is through Northern Virginia. I should not have been riding my bike, but I did it. It's some young self-preservation. And then um, I started realizing, like I had one or two sleepovers at Jessica's, and then I started realizing I could stay over at her house a lot. So like every week I started to have maybe two or three sleepovers at Jessica's house and you know, could her and her sister shared a room. I wasn't scared to go to sleep there. They had a shower, they had video games, you know. There was other kids and um, a mom and dad, I don't know what else to say. And uh, during this time, I, I was seeing my dad a little bit, but he wasn't helping me. Then, I met another friend named Janelle, and so sometimes I could spend the night at her house. So I started to play the game of what friends could I spend the night with. That just helped me stretch things out. Uh, I don't know what, you know, help me have some joy, help me um, have something other than the rice and the can of peas, right? And um, help me get some sleep because I would sleep at their houses. The summer then when school was out, I was like, you know, all day, every day at my granddad's dirty house. Other family would come, they would come to visit him. And again, I was just, t I was under everybody's radar. So my friend Heather, who I got banned calling long distance, we did write each other all the time. And again, so thankful for her friendship. It became like I was gonna go spend a week with her for the summer, in the summer, and then it turned into, I ended up spending the whole summer there. Like I went back home to my granddad's dirty house once or twice. Pretty quickly I was like, oh, I need to, I'm going to stay here all summer. And I mean, again, both her parents worked and it was me and her and her two brothers. Her parents worked in the medical field, so it seemed like they would have a week where they both worked a lot, like night shift and just different schedules and then they would have another week where they were involved in taking his places so on their heavy working weeks we had to stay inside while they worked but again like we were inside with food and cable and air conditioning and it was fun you know we we watched tv and played video games and ate ramen noodles and if her parents worked during the day they'd be home at three or four and then we could go roller skating and ride bikes and it's really a haven for me and I was so thankful because I wasn't alone. We just had a fantastic summer and her parents took us to the lake and like I said, went tubing and we had meals and I got to sleep at night and I got to shower regularly. And I think her mom even bought me some fresh summer clothes. Her mom also paid us to um, like get the beetles off the garden, like five cents a beetle. And I remember, you know, saving up, I, earned twenty dollars and it was just a good summer but that was something I did to survive I I went for a week and I was like oh I I have to stay here and her family had no problem with me staying there and then it was time for school to start back and then it was sixth grade kind of the same thing all over again yeah so I had a whole a whole next year and again my I would see my mom maybe once a week she just was having a hard time then and all of sixth grade was just like how I described fifth grade. But I had my couple of established friends, and again, out of a seven day week, I was definitely trying to have sleepovers every weekend at someone's house. The sleepovers were my survival and the bike, and it just all continued a whole other year of that. And then that next summer, it was already established. I had spent the summer before with Heather's family, and so it was just planned. I was gonna spend all summer with her family, and I did. And again, I am so thankful for that because I was really lonely. <laughs> and yeah, so I guess I'm just continue to say the same things. With those few little friends I made and those few little things I learned, like kind of like no one else is gonna save me, I'm gonna need to save myself type, type skills, I guess was with Heather. Then when I got back, and I had continued to see my dad once in a while, 
I don't know if it was like once every week, but you know, I saw him. He would come and get me and maybe take me to dinner over at his brother's house or if it was Christmas, he would pick me up to take me to a Christmas party at a family member's house. Still an alcoholic, still gambling, still very sick all the time, but he would come and get me and I don't even really know. It was just, it was like a little treat I would get once in a while. Again, like he wasn't taking care of me. Really no one was taking care of me but me. So I came back from that summer at Heather's and it was time to start middle school. I had made another friend I could add to my friend's sleepover rotation named Katie. And so then I had, I had Jessica, Janelle, and Katie <laughs> I could rotate those sleepovers with. And again, all of them, like I think Katie's mom was a single mom and it was her and her sister, but you know, they had a home and meals and clothes in a closet and a bedroom and I was so thankful for them. And looking back now, as a 43 year old woman, I'm just very thankful for my friends at the time. My friend Amanda, her dad was, when I met her in middle school, her dad was like the general manager at a really nice hotel in the Tyson's Corner area. And so I remember I got invited to her house for a sleepover. And her house was the big fancy hotel and they had turned part of one of the upper floors into their apartment that they lived in and you know big spacious room big views and then their yard we would go up onto the roof of the building and they had like a rock area and barbecue and chairs and Amanda and I would go down to the hotel restaurant and like do fancy ordering you know we'd get the shrimp cocktail and we'd get the Shirley temples and we would order the restaurant food and so I started having sleepovers there too as I could. I was still in special ed. What was nice looking back now is those same kids that I was in special ed starting in fifth grade and this is a big deal I feel like for a city area. Here let me move my little spice rack uh, camera there. Those same kids that I had been in special ed in fifth grade and sixth grade. We were in special ed together now at the new middle school at seventh grade. Only we had a few new characters in our group. But the core group was there. And I did chorus and like I said, made friends with Amanda. Katie was in special ed with me, so we had become friends over the years. Um, so that actually gave me four different people by seventh grade that I was rotating sleepovers with. Um, so again, yeah, I just, I tried to, my goal was to have to sleep at home as little as possible. And I had somehow during that, I went into seventh grade with new clothes. So I think my request was heard somewhere that I needed money for clothes for school, like some actual decent clothes. I still didn't have a bathing, like a proper bathing situation at my granddad's house, but again, at these friends' houses. And then I started to see my dad a little more regular at that time. Every weekend, Amanda and I started to go to Tyson's Corner Mall. And so my dad would drop me off on Saturday at the mall with her and give me $20 and I had to make that $20 stretch, right? So that was, if I got anything at Claire's, I had to make sure I still had enough to like eat lunch at the Wendy's at the mall, or if uh, Amanda and I were gonna go to the movies, I may not be able to get that choker at Claire's, right? So, but it was fun. So I started spending every Saturday at the mall and then I would, if I didn't have a friend, so I started to add my dad into my sleepover rotation that I had developed for survival over the years. So, so I started to stay at my dad's house some, or his apartment, and I kind of had a bedroom there with a bed and a shower. Anyway, it just picked up where my dad and I were doing some things. He was still an alcoholic. He still went to the racetrack, but we would do things like go to the racetrack and then go to Waffle House, you know, at two or three in the morning, or I would spend the night and he would make burritos and we'd watch a movie. And I don't, I don't at that point remember him being a violent drunk, like breaking up furniture. By that point, I mean, I think 
when he died, he was probably younger than I am now, which is another sad thing to think about because he seemed really old. <laughs> and I'm sure I seem old to my kids too. He had lived a very rough life by that point. So he would drink and fall asleep. And at that point he was on a lot of antidepressant medication. And I didn't know it then, but they were switching his antidepressants a lot, which is a lot. And he was drinking heavily with them. So, you know, and they had to know he was an alcoholic, right? You gotta learn all the, I mean, he didn't hide that fact. So that was scrambling him up more. And there came a point where somehow within all that, and I'm trying to line up my timeline right, but somewhere with, within this season, and I had been seeing my dad, like I said, once a week, kind of regular, dropping me off at the mall, those kind of things. I had decided I was gonna run away and I was gonna to try to ride my bike from where I lived in Northern Virginia all the way to where my friend Heather lived in the country. I was just going to do that. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have a full plan on what I was gonna do once I did that, but that's what I was gonna do. And so I made my plan, I packed my book bag, uh, I packed cans of tuna, I packed a can opener. It was a plan. <laughs> um, and. I rode my bike all the way to where I knew my mom was and I sat there and I ate a can of tuna. I just remember thinking, wait a minute, I have a dad. I'm going to have him come get me. So I rode my bike all the way back home and I called my dad and I said, I need you to come get me. But it felt different. And I felt like he, he felt that it was different. So he did, he came and got me. And I spent that night at his house and it was in the middle of a school week. Maybe I hadn't spent the night in the middle of the school week before. But anyways, middle of the school week, I spent every night, like I, I moved myself in. He came to get me, I had a bag packed and I was done with the situation that I had been left in. And so uh, it was fall and rolling into the holiday season i remember doing the holidays this is what i'm playing with and looking down at every once in a while also uh nail polish is slowly coming off but again th thanks for hanging with me that holiday season my dad and i like i remember um doing thanksgiving at his brother's house and some meals at nice restaurants out and I was sleeping like in a bed in my own room every night and I had my clothes hanging in a closet and I could shower and do my makeup <laughs> and my dad kind of made us a dinner meal every night and I remember hearing him on the phone. I think he was talking to someone in his family and they were asking him if I was, you know, officially living with him now and he said that he wasn't sure, but he thought so. Also during that time, so I was there every night. He took me to school every day, picked me up from school many days, or I got a ride over, but I was just with him a whole lot. And I do remember at some point my mom saying, I don't know why I'm letting you, you know, stay with him all the time but I guess it's okay and I just remember thinking in my mind and I, I was 12 no I was I think I was 13 at that time it had been a while um, so I think I had turned 13 that summer and I was in seventh grade and um, I just remember thinking that you know I had to live with him like I I had years of figuring out, you know, from the time I was 10 years old, 10 to 13, so 3, 10, 11, 12, 13, I guess depending on how, how, how you count it, is it three years or four years, depends on when the birthday, your birthdays fall, but I had had a whole life of carrying on, but I had had a good three solid years of trying to survive on my own. I had to stay with my dad to have my own little version of normalcy. So, and again, he, he was a tired drunk by then. Uh, what started to happen during that time is my dad just started talking about how he didn't know how much longer he would be around. 
and I remember we were at a Christmas party at my aunt's house and we got back in the car and I remember him saying to me, he just he was just talking about his feelings and about how he didn't know how much longer he was gonna be around. And I just remember sitting there listening to that at 13, not knowing what to do with that. And the things he was saying to me, he was saying to other people also, he was saying it to other family members and to other friends and people he worked with. So he was definitely, crying out for help and all his doctors were doing were adjusting his antidepressants. And so a couple days before January 19th, I got sick and I came down with chicken pox. And um, my mom took me to like Emerge Care that Saturday and got me, I believe it was antibiotics and dropped me back off at my dad's. My dad took care of me that weekend. He brought me all my meals in on a little plate and I just laid there and rested and took my antibiotics and ate my little plate meals and slept. And that Monday morning, I heard a very loud noise and um, it was so loud. And because I had grown up with my dad breaking all the furniture all the time. When I woke up with that loud noise, I thought, my goodness, dad must be so upset that he flipped the refrigerator over. It was so loud. And a few minutes went by and then I heard it again. And I just remember thinking, I need to stay right where I am. And time went by and of course, I was sick with chicken pox. I apparently fell asleep and I woke up again to the sound of the phone ringing and I went out and I answered the phone and it was my mom and she asked if my dad was up yet and I said, no, um, no, I think he's still asleep. And she said, well, he had a doctor's appointment this morning. Um, you need to go wake him up. And so, hold on a second. And so, um, I went into his room. When I opened the door, I saw his feet, and he wasn't covered up, and he usually was. He was not in the nude, but I mean, he usually had a sheet or something on him. And, um, I saw a hole like in the window and um, he was just, he was laying there. He had shot himself. Um, usually at this part of the story, I kind of speed it up a little bit for those listening. Cause I know again, it's a lot, but he, um, he apparently was standing up and the bullet went through his chest in and to the wall and down and I didn't know that at the time, but later when they came, they had to rip part of the wall out to get the bullet out. Um, and he was just laying there with the hole in his chest. I, I don't remember it being very gruesome. You know, it was just kind of like an anatomy thing if there was a hole there. I mean, I assume by this point, if you all are still watching, you, you have made choices on what you want your family to sit and listen to, right? Anyway, and his eyes were open and his arm was stretched out and he had his car title by his bed and that was that and I ran back and I called my mom and um, all the calls were made all the people came and so after that I guess you can say we got back together as a family again to some extent I was with my mom again and so I guess you can say that that was the blessing in my dad dying is that I got my mom back for a time I don't know that that would have happened if my dad had not have died there were just so many things at 13 that I was just left feeling very confused about my granddad he had promised my grandma some agreement that my granddad would buy my mom a little house for the time that she took care of my grandma. And so during that time he did, and we moved back to this area. That was a property my mom had until recent years. And it's like 
so much, just so much. So there were definitely still things that happened in my teen years, but a whole lot happened from the time I was born until my dad died. And then some more stuff happened later in my teen years. I just think those years my mom left me, I don't know what to say other than she blanked out. If you've watched the movie, I haven't read the book yet, I have it on audiobook, while well, I'm listening to Where the Crawl Dads Sing on the audiobook, but I watched the movie also, and um, I'm on team. I still think the audiobook that I'm listening to is better than the movie, but I know everyone, you know, everyone has big th thoughts and feelings on it, but uh, I got a lot more details in the book, okay. Anyway, a line from the movie, which I haven't got that far in the audiobook yet, was they said that it took the mom, the mom had been abused and lived with alcoholism and a lot of mess from the dad in that story for a real long time. And the mom one day, so it's very hard for me because in the book and in the movie, the mom just walks away one day and she doesn't come back for the little girl. And so, but they say in that fictional story that it took the mom a good year to even remember that she had children. So I just think that my mom broke for a little bit. There were still lots of feelings whenever we got back together and I still don't think she saw my perspective on what I had just lived through all those years. And there were many times I had tried to give perspective or explain and um, it just wasn't heard. So I don't know what to say <laughs> other than in high school, the bullying and stuff continued. Only I did try to have nice clothes then and I did have a shower and like at our new little house, I had a room and we tried to do some normal family things like have some dinner meals and go to the beach once in a while. There were just so many years of numbness and big gobs of stuff to process. And so good point is uh, continue to be real good friends with Heather and see her. And then if you've been around here for a while, you know when I was about 14 or 15, I saw this beautiful looking man boy walking through the parking lot with all his hair, looking like Tobin's hair now. And it was Travis and he was a senior and I was a freshman and I started praying for Travis, and my joke is I got what I prayed for, right? Because a few years later, he noticed me and started talking to me and got married a few years after that. And like I said, I've been married 24 years now. <sighs> but in high school, I got really involved in theater and art classes, made some new good friends. I felt like we kind of patched ourselves back together and kind of just tried to be normal <laughs> and go through normal motions of life after all of that. So in high school, I did not want to be part of special education anymore. They did have the smaller class, the services were offered to me. I was in regular classrooms. I did pretty well. That's when I really got into reading. You know, I had times where I had friends to eat lunch with and I had times where I didn't. So I learned about going to the library and reading and always having a book with me. I had a boyfriend or two in high school, went to the homecoming things, saw Travis from afar, you know, didn't know he was gonna be my baby daddy one day, ha ha. It just, there were just a lot of times that just felt kind of raw though, still. I don't know what else to say other than, you know, it was just kind of a lot to, to live through those years. So when I was in my junior year, I really, just really wanted to be done with going to school every day anyway. And so uh, another little known fact about me is I got my GED. It hasn't held me back at all in life, those of you who may have a GED or looking to get one. I was in my junior year and I was going to graduate a year early and I was graduating a year early doing the bare minimum I needed um, just to get out of high school at that point. Within all that I had met Travis and you know age-wise I was already we can say a year behind or a year ahead. So 
I wanted to go be with Travis. I was in another situation where I was living almost alone <laughs> by that point again. And I'm skipping some details there, but you know, this has been a long story, right? Long story time. So anyway, I moved down with Travis. I didn't have any adult guidance or parameters or, or whatever. And as my oldest son has told me, you know, thank goodness Travis was a good guy. But I moved down to be near Travis and be with him. And I took my GED test to just check that box and be done. And then there was um, a college I was able to walk right in and start that fall. I really had it in me uh, from all those years in school. You know, you gotta go to college, gotta go to college, you gotta go to college, gotta get the degree. So more stories for another day. But I really wanted to kind of share the whole childhood stuff, start to finish as best as I can in one evening held up here in this little area, just trying to run through it the best I can. Because I know some people over the years have thought, maybe I grew up in a big family, or some people have thought or implied, like, I've never had any struggles, or I don't know what it's like to struggle, or to not have any money, or those kind of things. And I just laugh at that, because I think, you know, that's not my story. I couldn't be anything farther from the truth. You know, it was not in my mind coming into young adulthood and marrying Travis that I was gonna have all these kids and homeschool them or start a business basically with $20 and bring my husband home full time and that kind of stuff. I just knew, you know, I love Travis and I figured at some day we would have one child and I would be home with that child and then if I was really radical later, we might have a second child. But like all of life, you learn and grow. And a couple years into our marriage, we had our first son and he was so wonderful. And then I learned about this thing called homeschooling. And because my schooling experience was between the bullying and I know a lot of it was home life stuff too. If I could have, you know, just gone to school every day and come home and done my homework and had a plate of dinner, you know, it might've been different, but I didn't have a very good view of it from all of my personal experience. And, you know, even in high school, when I was at the same school all of those years in a row, I wanted our kids to either go to private school or once I learned about homeschooling, to have to be homeschooled. So, so I am sure I will have a lot of questions and I do have several other videos planned spinning off of this. I am tired now and I have Again, we've talked a long time. I'm not ending quite yet, but I'm just saying that I know over these past eight years we're rounding up to, I have shared little bits, right? But now you have hopefully a full picture on my formative years and how they shaped me. Um, I know I mentioned Jesus early on in church and through all of this, I felt the Lord with me and I um, definitely and I'm gonna do a whole video for you on this like when I was 18 and like a young adult in this world I felt that Jesus had always been with me but I really got to know him for myself and I really felt like he guided me through renewing my mind and helping put some of the scrambled parts of me back I still had times, even in my 30s, where I would just have to get on the lawnmower and mow the grass for the three or four hours it took and just cry for most of that because I had so much pinned up in me. Just so much that still hurt. You know, once in a while now, I think back to 10-year-old Jay Morrell. Because again, it was those years, it, it was not even so much the years of everything with my dad, it was those ages from 10 to 13 that were the most, uh, if we wanna say traumatic for me, the hardest for me. And as an adult, you know, I would feel very bad or sorry for, I would hurt for myself for in those years. And then even, you know, as a young adult, experiences and such and we can say 
lies that were said to me that I believed about who I was that I had to also overcome. But I do, again, I'll make that into another video for you. Anyway, I just hope that you can take any part of this story and it has been helpful. If you grew up and you just feel like you're an adult now with just a very broken past, I hope that this encourages you that you can pick those pieces up, you can pick yourself up, and you are an adult now and you get to make your own choices. And I think so I'm kind of probably getting into this other video um, already, but I think that was something that had helped me is that I did feel the freedom of, of being out on my own and being able to make my own choices. Not always the right choices and definitely some things repeated. <laughs> I definitely felt a, a responsibility as a young adult to make my own way and how what I grew up in and the choices of other, pe other people didn't have to shape my choices as an adult. Now, I'm sure they shape my choices in the fact that I have had a heavy, heavy view of, and again, not that I am perfect, not that I'm doing this right, but things that are important to me, like how important mothering is. I said, my mom, I had all kinds of great nurturing when I was really, really little, and that was really important to me and my heart. And even though we had those years that we were separated, we've been able to work through the years on healing that, and she is the world's best mom to me as an adult, and she has been a phenomenal, full-on grandparent with all of our children. I mean, like our son, that's an adult now, and a dad, you know, he's grown up with a full-on involved grandmother, um, you know, took him to ice skating lessons and all the holidays and all of that as far as, you know, with her grandchildren and such and with me as an adult. She's been right there and many of you ask if she lives with us. She's just always been really involved, works real hard to, you know, never miss a vacation or an opportunity to go to the play go to the recital, go to the basketball game or whatever. And if going through all that brought me to finding Travis and us making it all these years and having all these babies and it has always been my priority to be home with my children, be available for my children. And that is where, and I can do a whole video for you on this too. And again, this is something else I've shared over the years, but. That's why, number one, it was important for me to go back to school and become a nurse, even though I had a degree in computers. Once I started having several little kids, I wanted a career where I could still make money to provide for my family. So if you've ever wanted to know, you know, why is this Jim Merrill always breaking her neck trying to make money to provide for her family? Well, I think part of my backstory shines a light on that. And that's why I went back to school to be a nurse so I could be home with my children and have a good weekend job. And that's why I think I was just wild enough to throw myself into um, online business and figuring out how to create an online business. You know, even before YouTube, I had a very successful online business that I always say, you know, brought Travis home in 2012. but. My business was successful enough to support us years before I even started on YouTube. And as things have grown over the years, as I've shared with you, I've continued to hire out help again and again and again for the things that my face doesn't have to be on. I, I train people, I do it. I train people how to do it. And I've grown a team of, we might be over 12 now, if I think so. <laughs> And I have people who've been with me and who've been helping me for years. And I believe that so much of my want to in uh, mothering my children and homeschooling my children and providing for my family, it all goes back to all that stuff as a young kid. I mean, I'm sure, right? We're all tangled up in our stories. So I am tangled up in my story, but God is good and he has brought us through so much 
and Travis has a tangled story too, which is not mine to tell other than, you know, we were two broken people that got married and we both desperately, I don't think, you know, we didn't, we weren't, again, self-aware enough at the time to know what we wanted other than we loved each other and we were gonna get married. But I think that the life that we have is the life that we both wanted back then. Um, and yeah, we just wanted to be married and not be addicts and have children and provide for our children and love one another and have a home and have meals and apparently 52 chickens was somewhere in there, but we just wanted, I know normal is, you know, normal means different things to different people, but we just wanted uh, whatever kind of close to stable life that we could figure out how to have together based on our past experiences. And his experiences were same but different than mine. So, the fact that we have stayed married and have developed the life and lived the life that we love, you know, all of those things are miracles in and of themselves. So our past does not have to define us. So I can make a little poem, but our past can refine us. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly what I wanna say, but we don't have to be held down by our past. We can use the experiences that we have come through to kind of fuel our fire on where we would like to be. And uh, that's about as poetic as I can get for you this evening. I don't know what to call this series, you know, the Jim Rowe Origin series, but again, I definitely, I am working on a video for you. I mean, once I finish this one, but on my list, I wanna do an extensive one about being bullied and such, more from there, and how I pulled myself together and came out of that, because when you come out of that and then you're in adult life, I don't, it's just surreal. Oh, I'm not that person that they said I was. And then I just got some other video ideas. So, huh. <laughs> so hope everyone's enjoying your beverage. Mm -hmm. Definitely a little more than bulk cooking or a grocery haul or a mega mama kitchen remodel. Many of us have those little girls in us that we're um, trying, to, trying to help in some different ways. So I appreciate you being my friend and listening. And I really hope that this whole video has helped somebody um, just by me being able to get a big chunk of my story out. And uh, again, thanks for listening. Where do we go from here? I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some other videos you could watch. I think we need a nap after this. Okay, thanks for watching, friend, and I'll see you real soon with another brand new video. Bye-bye. It's almost midnight, and I have spent three hours and 42 minutes recording this deep and wide vlog for you all. Um, I need to drive home now. I rented this little Airbnb near the house just so I could have a quiet several hour chunk to just get this all out. And you know, we got construction and kid noises and all of that. And I definitely wanted to just try to keep my thoughts straight. So again, a big, big, big thank you for hanging out and watching, watching my story and listening. And like I said, being my friend. Thank you. I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.